So uh, uh, now we are trying to uh, shift the topic from more regional to more global. And uh, the next speaker is uh, Professor Colin Grant. Uh, he is the professor in the A and E medicine, A and E uh, medicine uh, educate, academic unit of the Chinese University of Hong Kong. He will talk about uh, the challenges of uh, uh, emerge, uh, of the education in emergency medicines. So uh, please welcome the uh, professor Colin. Good afternoon, Axel. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. yes. Excellent. Thank you. Lovely to be here as always. I'm very grateful to the Asian Society and to Axel and the committee for inviting me to come along. Can you see my slides on the screen? Yes. Excellent. So those first two talks have been superb. I've learned an awful lot from them and I'm gonna take a more generic view of challenges in EM education. And I suspect for all of us on this um, webinar this afternoon, none of this will be remotely surprising um, because we see it, we all see it in different forms um, in our own departments, in our own countries uh, every day of the week. So let me just run through all this. I've got no obvious conflicts to, to um, declare other than the fact I'm involved in teaching medical students and, and trainee doctors. But I thought I'd just pick on three things, really, and, and clearly there will be some overlap with the other talks today. I just thought I'd have a little uh, recap on emergency medicine teaching in, in normal times. Now, if anyone can give me a definition of what normal means nowadays, I'd be grateful, because I have no idea what normal means anymore. I think it's, it's, it's incredible times we live in. Um, and uh, normal, I think, really is challenging to, to nail. Um, I obviously want to talk a little bit about what COVID has done. And we've, in Hong Kong, maybe had more recent experience of this than many other countries um, represented here today. And very briefly, I'm going to talk about future possibilities. But I realise there are other speakers later in the day who are focusing on that. So I'll keep that brief. So going back. Many, many years. This book dates back to 1959, I think it was, if I remember correctly. Morris Ellis was regarded as the, the kind of father of casualty surgery in the UK back in um, the 50s and the 60s. He was the first full-time casualty consultant, as it was called in those days, at Leeds General Infirmary in the north of England. And... Um, you know, this, this book ran to many editions and was regarded as the Bible of emergency medicine in those times. And in those days, honestly, the only teaching that you got was this little book. There wasn't much else. But you did get an apprenticeship. You got a very tightly delivered apprenticeship from your boss or bosses if you were very lucky. And that really continued right up to the time when I started in the 90s, where... Again, I think many of us on this webinar will remember those days when we turned up every morning for the first three or four weeks of our uh, first job in the A&E department. And we were given tutorials every morning for an hour or so to, um, to, to, to pick up the, the perils of the trade. And uh, I, have, I was talking to someone about this recently, and I made the comment that I think I learned more in those two or three weeks than I learned in five years in medical school in terms of practical, sensible, experientially based um, medicine and surgery. It was phenomenal. The books eventually um, became a little bit thicker. This is one I was involved in some time ago and, and the new version which came out more recently. These have sold quite a lot of copies. I mean, the, the fifth edition is now up to close to a quarter of a million. And there's very few departments nowadays, um, you know, where you won't find one or two copies of this or similar. There are many other equivalents. Shirley Yui and colleagues have just published a great um, handbook in Singapore. And um, there are other versions around the world. So I wouldn't claim this is the only one. But um, as, as emergency medicine has got more and more technical and more and more comprehensive for all the different disciplines that we dip our toes into, these books are getting thicker and thicker and getting harder and harder to cover everything that needs to be covered. 
Hong Kong, we have our own version. This is Practice of Emergency Medicine, which is the book put together by the, um, the college. And um, this is the second edition. The third edition is in progress and several of my colleagues are working on that right now. And uh, it's a lot of work. And the problem with all of these is that they are out of date before they're published um, as things change so fast. Um, but there's no question, having been involved in the world of publishing as a, an author and as an editor, people have said to me for the last 15 years that books and journals, uh, nobody wants the paper editions anymore. Well, that's simply not true. Almost all of you have bookshelves in your offices and at home, and most of us like to actually hold a book in our hands. These are not going away. Websites help undoubtedly and I think websites if they're well maintained and, and kept you know dare I say up to date not to mention any trademarks um, are probably pretty good in terms of getting the latest uh, interactions and drug th drug effects and such like but most of us will still regard textbooks as a useful thing to do but coming back the challenges of teaching in emergency medicine undoubtedly relate to the challenges of working in an environment like this. This is a picture of my department. Um, many of my colleagues are on the call today, and you will all recognize that. I'm sure you have sweat running down the back of your neck just looking at that picture. This is the reality of what we do every day and um, trying to sort things out. This picture obviously was taken before COVID. There's not that many masks around that um, this is the reality of what we do every single day of our lives and how do we then provide education in this environment. So what are the challenges? Well, the challenges are split into two and, and I'm deliberately not including specialist uh, emergency physician continuing education here because I think that's an entirely you know, additional layer which I'm not going to cover. But if we take trainee doctors, and, and uh, our previous speakers have talked about this in, in much more detail than I will, but essentially getting people together is the first problem. We are asynchronous people. We work on different shifts. We Someone's always on night. Someone's always on holiday. Someone's always sick. So getting everyone together is notoriously difficult. We have different levels of experience. Nine days ago, we had another bunch of new colleagues join us in our department and across the city and um, they're great people but one of our real challenges is sometimes we have to help them to unlearn all the bad habits that they picked up in their other jobs so we can teach them the right way of doing things because the way we do things is often not the way that the other departments think we do things. So those different levels of experience give us different starting points and different challenges and that that really is Different, difficult to deal with. It's like starting a race at different parts of the racetrack and everyone has the same finishing line. Um, the exposure to clinical situations can occur at any time. You know, you may see your first emergency room thoracotomy on the second day of your job. You may see it the day before you retire. It's almost impossible to know when these scenarios will come round. Now, clearly common things are common. But for the uncommon scenarios that we all need to deal with, that we all have to have in our minds for that once a year or once in a lifetime um, calamity scenario that we all know we need to, to be at least capable of, of running the, the, the situation, that can happen at any time. And that's really challenging given the breadth of what we deal with. Compulsory training, certainly in our context, in our experience, has been difficult to enforce. Um, I wouldn't say it's impossible, but especially given the asynchronous nature of what we do, I think it is difficult. In Hong Kong, I think we've seen huge improvements in this over the last five years or so, particularly with a really, really good e-logbook system that uh, C.T. Loy and my colleagues and in the college have put together over the last uh, five or 10 years. We now log procedures online. We now log um, educational activities online, the CPD online. It's all done through an app. It's phenomenal compared to what we used to do in terms of what I remember with paper-based log books where we had to carry things around and get them all signed off. I think this is a huge step forward. What about our medical students? Well. 
again, this is the normal situation. Uh, certainly in my institution, we get eight days out of six years of training. Eight days. It's not a big emphasis on emergency medicine, but it's still better than what it used to be. The students are enthusiastic at the start of final year. I had 19 students in my tutorial two weeks ago, and that was great. By the end of the year, that'll be about six because they're focusing on other things. We do have a very good intensive two week long critical care course that we are heavily involved in with our intensive care colleagues. And I think that gives them a very good introduction to all aspects of acute care. But again, there has to be integration of that course with what they then see in the ED and linking those two together is a bit of a challenge. We know that examinations drive learning for students and certainly again in our context, but I think it's reflected across Asia. We don't have that many academic staff for leadership in teaching and to set the programs up in ways that we want to, to, to deliver the best opportunities for students. I'll come on to this in more detail in a minute, but there are a genuine lack of opportunities for clinical exposure, despite the numbers of patients that present to our EDs. And that's partly because the realities of the shop floor means it's difficult to do. Although I have to take my hat off to all of my clinical colleagues who are almost without exception, enthusiastic teachers. And we see that across the city and across the region. And I think it's again, a function of volume rather than enthusiasm. Now, what about COVID? Well, we've all had to suffer COVID. We're not unique in that respect, but we've certainly um, had a very, um, a very steep increase in cases earlier this year, around about February and March. I'll show you some photographs in a moment. And I, it was, it was, it made world news because things went wrong so quickly in Hong Kong. Now, why did it go wrong? It went wrong partly because we'd done so well before. We'd had very few cases. Our vaccination rate was not as high as it should have been, particularly in the elderly vulnerable population. And therefore, we, we saw a huge um, ramp up in the numbers of cases. And then it fell off again fairly quickly. And we've now settled down to about 2,000, 3,000 cases um, a day. In Hong Kong, what happened at the beginning was students were completely excluded from all hospital teaching. Now, you may say to yourself, that's a bit draconian, and certainly that was my reaction, but Hong Kong has a long history of um, being worried about infectious disease after SARS. SARS back in 2003 led to the deaths of several uh, healthcare professionals, including doctors, Many medical students got SARS and were very unwell with it. We didn't want that to happen again. And there's therefore a very significant risk aversion by the hospital authority who control access to clinical facilities. Um, interestingly, some of my senior colleagues in other disciplines didn't think the emergency department was a high risk environment, which I found really fascinating. Couldn't understand why there might be COVID patients in the ED. Um, and um, they got a bit of a shock when we pointed out to them that that's exactly where patients with COVID come to. PPE was a problem at the beginning, and we converted to online teaching, which, like for everyone, was a challenge at the beginning, although webinars like this confirm that this is not only doable, but very successfully doable now. Subsequently, things have got a little better. We were just at the point of bringing students back to the shop floor of the ED in January when we had our big fifth wave outbreak. But now we have them back on the shop floor. The students can't go into high risk areas, but at least they can come down and see what it's like in the clinical emergency department, which is great. And the feedback's been incredibly positive. Again, the, um, the, the burden on staff is high. Um, the students are very keen on actually getting down and the paper tracing system to trace and track, track and trace where patients and students have interacted is really very clunky. And I think we need to improve those systems. And I think if we can find something that works across different um, regions and countries, that would be 
even better. What happened with, with doctors with COVID? Well, again, you know, we had to switch things back to infection control training. We had to um, basically abandon everything else. And, and a lot of our teaching for a few months really didn't happen at all. Um, as everyone was exposed to this new virus and new data, this, the learning curve was incredibly steep for those first few months. And indeed, I would say the first 18 months, really, until we had a handle on vaccination and how effective it might be. Uh, and of course, many patients who thought they were having reactions to the vaccines when they first came out all pitched up at the emergency department as well. So that added to the workload, too. But um, certainly, again, in Hong Kong, many staff avoided going home because they didn't want to risk infecting their families. Many of them stayed in hotels and guest houses. Um, and, and teaching anyone when they're stressed and when they can't see their family and they can't um, do whatever their normal activities might be is virtually impossible. I think it's asking an awful lot. Again, though, I think things got better. Our numbers dropped, um, but the patients who were there needed a fair bit of support um, and, and obviously intensive testing and, and checking out. And, and our methods changed too, using things like um, virtual communications to avoid face-to-face -face contact was also new for all of us. And the changes in protocols were difficult to keep up with too. But again, we got around this to some degree by implementing Zoom teaching. And we continue that Zoom teaching to this day to try and at least give people um, an opportunity to learn. Those Zoom meetings have been great. We have had much higher attendances. It's not perfect, but it's much better than it was because people don't have the excuse that they have to come to the hospital. They can do it from their bedroom. They can do it from the coffee shop. As long as they attend, it's something to do. I think it's great. And as, as people have become more familiar with it, there's more engagement over time. Our training committee has continued to do intermittent monthly trainee um, training afternoons. They've been very well received. I think they're really, really good with a dedicated exam preparation topics as well as clinical topics. And now the patient numbers are coming back to normal course, the experiential learning is beginning to return to where it used to be. This was what uh, the departments across the city were. This is one of them, but uh, um, all the departments across the city looked like this. Our department looked like this. We had patients lying outside. And there was one weekend in February where we had all these elderly patients who were COVID positive lying outside and the temperature was to go down to 10 degrees. And that led to a complete reconfiguration of the system to get these patients indoors. Hong Kong's a pretty warm place most of the year, but this coincided with the coldest weekend of the year. And we had to get them in. Otherwise, they wouldn't die of COVID, but they'd die of hypothermia. And um, the pressure on the system around this time was absolutely horrendous. Uh, there's no other way of saying it. But I think everyone woke up to the fact that this needed to happen. And uh, we got on with it. And uh, the peak and then the drop off was actually very, very stark. So who won and who lost in this? Well, the winners, I think, have been the trainee doctors because Zoom has given us a new platform that we, is almost being forced on us, but has actually worked very well. And that uh, increasing use and increasing familiarity encourages more participation. I think the students have lost out. I think we need to increase that degree of clinical exposure. And I think as time goes on and we see that the emergency department isn't infecting students and students aren't infecting patients in the emergency department, we'll hopefully be able to get them back to the full range of exposure. Is the exposure important? I don't think it affects their factual knowledge. Anyone can read a book and anyone can learn about the numbers and the the facts, but I think the experiential learning is profoundly affected and you cannot simulate the ED in any meaningful way in terms of how it feels to manage a shop floor. I am worried about how this will affect students' perceptions of EM. We want to encourage the brightest and the best to come into our wonderful specialty. 
I think there are those who will say, well, we didn't get exposed to it. I don't know what it's like. I'll go and do something else. I think it will also have an impact because students won't be aware of how we work, even if they choose to work in other disciplines. And as we all know, that interaction between our inpatient friends and colleagues and how we work in the ED is critical for the patient care that we try and deliver between us. Other countries did different things. The UK brought forward final year graduation to let them join the workforce. Australia and New Zealand rostered students and gave them full PPE and just got on with it. And the US, most schools continued. I think these all had risks and benefits, but there's no one way to get this right. For the future, and I will leave this mostly to my future colleagues who are going to speak this afternoon, you, we could have a simulated ED environment, but I think it's difficult to do. We don't have a lot of space in Hong Kong and many countries around Asia are the same. And I think when you've got a full ED times 17 or 18 across the city, and that's not including our private hospital colleagues, why do we need to simulate it when we can put pay, pay students in there to see the real thing? Virtual reality, I think, is also an option, um, and that is increasingly um, accurate, increasingly good at delivering, and uh, I think there's certainly options there, although it can be costly. Online, as we've talked about, using things like Zoom and using online case-based training uh, programs can be very useful. One of our colleagues, Alex Law, has just done some work looking at this and showed that it's a very viable option, although again, the software can be expensive. And game-based teaching is becoming more and more popular. And finally, I think blended learning works. Our intensive care course uses a very blended learning approach. Students interact online, do their assignments, do their quizzes and things, and then we see them to deliver the practical skills by simulation, which I think is a good way of using time. So to finish off, COVID-19, I think, has been a real curse for our students. We're, we're getting rid of the curse now, but it's been a big problem and we need to work hard to get them back online completely. But I actually think in the fullness of time, we may have actually improved some of the teaching and training available for our future specialists, our ED trainees. But we need to keep working on this to try and change things as the situation continues to change and invest in new approaches to deal with the realities of this. COVID will not be our last infectious disease challenge. Um, and we have to be able to work towards this for the future as well. As always, it's been a pleasure to have the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you, Axel. Thank you, the Asian Society. And uh, I'll look forward to uh, answering your questions in the discussion later. Thank you. Well, thank you, Colin, very much uh, on, on your uh, presentations. Uh, Actually, the, uh, uh, Professor Colin has mentioned most of the important issue related to the influence of the pandemic to the uh, uh, emergency medicine educations. And uh, I actually, this, your, your three questions are really inspiring and worthwhile for us to think about and to discuss. Definitely, I think uh, our panel master and also some of the audience would like to discuss further on about uh, the three questions uh, during the panel's discussions. So, uh, I would like to proceed to the, to the next part of the presentations.